Swati Jing, right external member of the MTC. Thank you. Well, Governor, last year and the year before, um, the Monetary Policy Committee raised interest rates in total 14 times, I think, um, in order to bring down inflation from these intolerably high mm. levels that we were experiencing. And clearly by the second half of last year, that had tipped the UK economy into recession. And the forecast that you published at your latest report seems to indicate that inflation, all other things being equal, will revert to, to target sometime this year, as I understand it. And I just wondered if you could summarise for the committee and for the public at large, uh, given that inflation is back down at 4% and forecast to be 2%, that the economy is in recession, uh, what would it take for the Monetary Policy Committee to actually reduce the headline level of interest rates now? So what would it take, what are the indicators that you would want to see, Governor, before you did that? Certainly. I'm happy to do that. Um, first of all, I should say that you're right to say that our latest forecast does suggest that inflation will go back to target, uh, we think probably sort of spring time this year. It won't stay there, we think, uh, because there are some peculiarly large, particularly negative energy uh, effects which will not be permanent. So we are predicting a, a bit of a pickup uh, towards the end of this year, but nothing on the scale of what we saw, obviously, as you were referring to in the past. But since, since obviously our objective is to sustain inflation at target, we are looking beyond that, if you like, that, that temporary uh, period of being down, what we think will be down at target. Uh, we, we want to get it down and keep, keep it down, as it were. Now, you're right that the economy uh, appears to have had a, a period of recession in the last two quarters of last year. Uh, monetary policy has been restrictive, generally. We've said this a number of times. Um, I should say it's also against a backdrop of very weak growth on the supply side of the economy, which we no doubt come back to. But monetary policy has been intentionally restrictive, um, and that has been, and inflation has come down very rapidly. A lot of that is to do with the unwinding of the, of the global inflation shocks, but monetary policy has played its part, and we've always in, intended that to be so. What I would say, and then I'll come on to the specific points, points you raised, but can I just make one point, which I think is very important here, which hasn't got coverage. All of this is happening uh, in a context of the economy being at full employment. Um, so we've had this period of, of rapid disinflation. We've had, yes, restrictive monetary policy. But on all the measures we use, the economy appears to be at full employment. That is a very good story. It's, a very, it's very good news. We don't want unemployment rising rapidly. It has happened in the past when we've had to do you know, these sorts of actions. So I would just say against a lot of talk about what is a... We think going to be a very small recession. We think the economy is already actually uh, you know, showing distinct signs of, a, of, a, of an upturn can come back to that. So what are we looking for on the permanent front? Well, three things we really look for. And they're all to do with this question about persistence. So looking through these energy effects, we look at particularly at uh, services prices because that has a very big domestic content of inflation in it. So it, tends to sort of, in a sense, look beyond these more temporary, temporary energy type effects. We are looking at uh, pay, and we are looking at quantities in the labour market. And that comes back to the point I just made about the fact that you know, we, you know, the good, piece of good news is that the, that the economy is at full employment. But I'll finish by saying this. It does mean that we have to, because of this, you know, it's a very tight situation, it's a narrow path that we're walking because of this. It means that we have to be very you know, alert to these things. But what I'm looking for, and we very clearly changed the framing of the decision at the February, uh, in the February report, from the question of how restrictive does policy have to be to for how long does it have to remain restrictive. Well, I said in the press conference, I think that is how long before we, we can cut interest rates based on the path we see. And so I'm looking for a more sustained 
progress on those three things, which really are the more persistent elements. We've seen, I think, encouraging signs on them. So, you know, services prices still above so service inflation is still above above six percent. Some signs of it coming down now. I think some signs that pay is now adjusting down towards the lower headline inflation, which is what I'd expect to see. Quantity side of the labour market remains actually tight. There's no question about that. But it, it's, it's the progress of those three things. And we, we don't need, obviously, inflation to come back to target before we cut interest rates. I must be very clear on that. That's, that's not necessary. So we'll be looking for sustained progress on those things to, to, to reach that judgment about how long this period of restrictive policy needs to be. But we have very clearly signaled this change. Thank you, Governor, for the introductory um, uh, outlook. But, um, Dr. Broadbent, can I refer to the evidence that we're publishing alongside this session where you've summarised some of your <coughs> points? And, and you echo uh, the points about services prices, pay, and labour market um, data. And I think what worries the committee is that there's been such a um, lack of clarity about labour market data. There have been a lot of questions um, about labour market data. And um, I wondered whether you would like to comment on um, how timely the, the bank um, is able to get information on labour market compared to perhaps the lagged data that you would get from the ONS on the state of the labour market. What, are there any particular indicators that you look to um, drilling down into those, those indicators around <coughs> service prices and pay and the labour market? Well, starting with the labour market, on the, on the quantity side, um, we have quite a lot of information from surveys of businesses, say, about employment trends. Some of those, for example, our own decision maker panel survey are, are also forward looking. So as far as the quantity numbers employed concern, we have, we think, reasonably good real-time indicators. Um, where we have less, inevitably, is on the, if you like, the composition of non-employment. Uh, so critical for us is uh, our indicators related to the tightness of the labour market, the leading one of which might be unemployment or some variant thereof, like the ratio of vacancies to unemployment, for example. And if you want to know, you know whether someone who is not working is either inactive, i.e. they're not working and they're not looking for work, or they're unemployed, they're not working but they are looking for work, the only way you can really get that is by asking households and the only source of that information ultimately is the labour force survey from mm. the ONS. Mm. Yeah. So that is undoubtedly, um, I mean, it's, it's always somewhat uncertain. There's no piece of economic data that is um, absolutely precise because you're relying on samples. Um, but at the moment, it's more imprecise than usual because mm. of the, the, the decline in the response rate to the LFS. And, and Governor, I note last week when you gave evidence to the Lords Committee, um, that you did specifically mention some of the bank's uh, modelling uh, in this area um, and that you've a number of models that estimate wage equations, none of which, frankly, has performed well. Does that worry you? Well, it's one of the reasons why we've asked Ben Bernanke to do the review he's done. Um, so it's a good example. We've, we've actually used a chart in a number of the reports, and I've used it in the press conferences, actually, which show what we call a, a swathe, which is the sense the, the projections of, of, of pay produced by, I think it's, it's three models we have actually, for three sets of models. Um, and then we also overlay that with, with what the committee has actually judged, I emphasise the word judged, to be what it thinks the path of pay is, drawing on a lot of other information, including from our regional agents, for instance. And for some time now, that path that we have set has been above the, by, by, you know, pay rising more strongly than all three of the, uh, the models would suggest. Now, a lot of that reflects the, the, the nature of the, the unusual nature of the shocks that we've been, we've been going through, but it underlies why I was so keen that we did this review and had Ben Bernanke come in and do this, because you know, what it's it, it raises the question for us as a committee, well, how do we reach those judgments? Are there better tools out there that we could lay our hands on? Uh, you know, access to, you know, are we getting the, the, the right data? How are we processing the data? Um, and therefore, it was, you know, my view, I think, you know, we, we should learn from these experiences, clearly. So that's the background to it. 
You mentioned Dr. Bernanke's review, and we yeah. were expecting uh, that we would have had it by now, and we would be taking evidence from him uh, shortly. So I just wondered if you could update us on the timetable oh, of his oh, review. Oh, sorry if we get that impression. I expect that it will be produced sort of mid-spring. Um, I know he's writing very hard. He's working hard on it at the moment, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, so I would expect sort of somewhere in the middle of the spring, I think it will be, uh, be coming out. That's my current expectation. So I was only changed to that, but obviously let you know, but that's my current expectation. And has he shared any of his initial findings with you? You say he's writing it at the moment. He's busy writing it at the moment. I mean, we, we, he spent time with us back in the autumn. We have had quite a few conversations and very useful conversations, but he's hard at work writing at the moment. And has he shared any of his findings with you that you're using to inform decision we're making? Not, we're not currently using, use, using his findings. We're really giving him the time to, uh, to put his thoughts together and, uh, and, and give us his thoughts. So I think that's the best thing to do in that sense. You've seen an, his initial thoughts, have you, Governor? Well, we've discussed his initial thoughts, yeah. Because yeah. he spent time with us. Um, he observed the whole November round of the MPC, and we had mm -hmm. quite a few conversations during that round. Uh, uh, about it, so we've certainly had conversations with him. So when is mid spring? Well, I don't want to be pinned down exactly because uh, he's 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 got the pen early as it were. Um, sorry. Spring is early this year. It's happening. Spring's now. early. Uh, well, well, <laughs> it's been a very mild winter, which is um, which is another part of the story. Mm. Uh, no, I, look, I would say <laughs> sometime probably in April, I would think, but I don't mm. say I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm going to be. You know, he's got to finish his writing, mm. and I don't want to give him the time that he needs to do it. So. Uh, Okay, we've heard April. That's yeah. on the record now. Government. Yeah, look, if it, if, um, if, it change, <laughs> if it changes, I'll let you know. That's, okay. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Dingra, I didn't ask you about the same indicators because you've made it very clear you think monetary policy is currently too tight. But I will ask uh, Megan um, what it would take for her to change her vote at the next meeting um, on March 21st. Which indicators would force you to, fit, to rethink uh, the level of interest rates in this country? Sure. So, uh, like many others, I'm looking at um, indicators of persistence. Um, I just changed my vote, as you'll all mm, know. Yeah. Um, and that's because I think we have learned something about persistence um, since late last year in the um, subsequent data outturns. So I think the surprises uh, on the labor market side with wages since November, at least, were significant. Um, mm. And then when, looking, when you're looking at services inflation, if you strip out the impact of energy, so just look at different metrics of core services, they're all actually trending down, save one, um, which is just flatlining. Um, and that's removing all the energy intensive sectors. It's also the most exclusive definition of core services inflation. Um, and so I think we've learned enough for me to change my vote to a hold. Um, but I do think that there are still risks um, in terms of wages. Um, we know from our agent survey that there's an expectation um, that wage growth will be around 5.4 percent this year. That's a bit higher than we're forecasting, so that presents some upside risk. Um, on the services inflation side, we know that fewer from the agent sur survey that fewer firms are going to be able to pass through price increases from higher wages, um, but there's a risk there too. It turns out um, consumer services firms uh, report, more of them report that they think they'll be able to pass through wage increases into higher prices. So that represents um, some upside risk on services inflation. So I would need to see a, a further uh, continuation of the trends that we've already seen. Um, the, you know, the data has been encouraging since late last year, but I would need to see further evidence before I were willing to change my vote. So Dr. Dingra, what are they all missing? What so, is what? Because you you want to see a loose about a true policy already. What are they all missing? I think I'm going to focus on where the evidence really swayed me to ch to come to a decision to cut rates. The first is we are on a downward trajectory in terms of consumer price inflation, and this is not a new phenomenon. This has been happening now for a few months. If we look at more forward-looking indicators like producer price inflation, which tends to lead consumer price inflation by about six to eight months, somewhere in that ballpark, even that's showing that there's more to come in terms of disinflation, including in non-energy services. And I think that's, that's fundamentally important for where price inflation is headed towards. If I combine that with sort of really seeing that despite that disinflation at play and despite the fact that there has been some real wage recovery, we're still seeing consumption very weak. 
and very different from some of the other advanced economies where mm. there has been a bounce back from the pre-pandemic levels. Mm. Here we aren't seeing that. Even so after it, January's retail sales? Even after January's that? retail okay. sales, unfortunately. About 2%, I would say, lower. 2.1, 1, if you want to be very precise about retail sales. On consumption, it's, it's lower than, it's about 1.8%. And I think that suggests to me that the downside risks at this point are substantial and therefore if we keep monetary policy tight for longer that would weigh even further on that sort of real activity. Okay thank you and Governor you saw Andy Haldane's remarks yesterday about being concerned that <coughs> the bank will be seen as having been too late to start tightening and then potentially too late to start easing what are your reactions to that uh, speech? Well, let me. I thought there was a lot of emphasis again on this point about the recession, um, and not as much emphasis on the point I made earlier about the fact that there is a also a strong story, particularly on uh, the labour market, actually also on household incomes. I mean, last year real household income grew by 1.8 percent. That's real household incomes. So there is a yeah, there is a strong story. I think Swati is absolutely right on consumption, and I think the question you know for us is, you know. We've seen quite quite, you know, quite a strong labour market. We've seen quite a strong household real income. It hasn't really come through to consumption. So is absolutely right on that point. Um, you know what will happen you know, this year will be interesting on that front. But I would emphasise just on this point about the recession. I mean, I think it's we have a very precise description, you know, definition of a recession in this country. It's two, two successive quarters of negative GDP growth. Um, the two successive quarters, i.e. Q3 and Q4 last year, I think cumulatively add up to minus 0.5% on, on GDP. If you look at recessions going back to the 1970s, this is um, you know, the weakest by a long way because the range, I think, for the, those two, the, the numbers for those two quarter numbers for all the previous recessions was something like 2.5% to 22% in terms of lost negative GDP. So, Minus 0.5 is a very weak recession. But how does the UK economy grow if you have uh, risks of inflation <coughs> uh, even when you're in recession? I'm, I'm just well, I think there's, there's two ways the UK grows. First of all, by, res by restoring price stability. That's a condition for stable growth. Um, and I think we're well on the way to doing that. But we have, we have to get, as I said earlier on, to this point where it's sustainable. And then the second thing is, and, and this is part of the, you know, the narrow path we're having to walk here, is that we've got weak supply side growth in this country, and we have had for some time. And so clearly to get more, you know, to get faster growth, we do need to see you know, stronger growth. We've had, large net Sorry? Inward, we've had large net inward migration. Is that not a supply side? But also, I mean, there's an important part of the story on the supply side, I think, which comes through from investment and productivity growth as well. I would, put, I would emphasize that. Now, again, I think, however, sustained stable prices and sustained inflation around targets is a condition for having, you know, I think, I think, you know, stronger, stronger supply side growth. So that again is a condition. But those are the things we need. Great, Stephen. Thank you. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Uh, can I just pick up on a couple of? Um, <coughs> going to follow on from the chairman's theme about a number of questions. But can I just first pick up in your opening remarks to the governor when talking about the fact that inflation was going to meet the target in the second quarter, but then rise again? You you talked about large energy effects. Yes. Uh, can you say why that wasn't clear to you in November? Oh, yeah. Because I think it's yes. been there as an effect for a while. And we've oh, been but it's got much bigger. So it's a really good question. So if you take the period between the November report at the beginning of November and the February report at the beginning of February, uh, the oil price for, fell by 13%. Gas prices, and we, we, we look at these sort of across, across the curve as well, fell by 36%. That, that's, that's a very big change in energy prices. Um, and they've moved again since, by the way, in the, in the period since we published the February report, the oil price is up about 9% and the gas price is down about 18%. So we've had these very big moves, and it's that I would particularly highlight that move in, uh, in energy prices in that period. And it, it was, you know, I have to say, something of a surprise because I remember I think we discussed at the last hearing um, obviously the threat from the terrible events going on in the Middle East. Um, if you look back in history, go back to the 1970s, which we've talked about a lot, you tend to see an increase in, you know, in the oil price, particularly in this context, and we haven't seen that. We've also had the second successive very mild winter actually in, uh, in Europe now and also in North America this time. 
Um, so that it, that explains a lot of it. So that by the time we get to the spring, this spring, and I think the, the the off gem numbers coming out sort of imminently, I think for the next set reset. But we, we yeah, we you, you can estimate it pretty pretty much now because we're through the observation period. I think our staff are telling us that we could see household the household energy price component of inflation having a negative annual rate of twenty five percent maybe now. That's a big change. Um, it won't. It won't <coughs> last. I mean, in the sense, because it's a percentage change, we wouldn't, wouldn't expect it to last. But that's what's going on. So that's why we've. That's a big con con contributor to the change we've seen in that period. And just to be clear, in the November report, you talked about target inflation being hit in first quarter twenty six. Yes. You're now forking, forecasting that to be a bit higher. 2.3, 2.4%, yes, I think. Yes, because the second... And is know. that some uncertainty about pricing, or is that market uh, lower imply, that implied market rates that you're concerned? Yeah. So, so I guess the two questions, am I right on that? And secondly, how inflationary do you regard <coughs> that, that movement, perhaps in terms of lower market rates, to be? Yeah. Well, I should have emphasised, sorry, at the beginning of the last answer, that because our forecasts are conditional, they're not unconditional. So they're conditional, as you said, on, I've talked about energy prices, they're also conditional. Um, on the market interest rate curve. Um, and the market interest rate curve between November and February, again, moved by, by about, on average, about 1% down. Um, it's actually corrected some of that subsequently. It's about 0.45 back up again now at the moment. But the consequence of all that was that, as you said, we moved from a situation where we had inflation coming back to target, um, as you said, about a year in, to one where it doesn't quite get back to target during the sort of during the period that we we look at um, now if you contrast that with the other the, the, the variant we published which is the so-called constant rate forecast where we don't change rates that had forecast inflation coming below target and heading further down below target so you know you, you, know, you can deduce what if you kept there. at that constant target you would hit it sometime you'd hit your uh, sorry if you kept rates at the constant rate you'd hit the inflation target sometime quarter three 25 yeah, but you'd also have inflation heading well below target going forward. Right, yeah. So oh. in your opening remarks, I think you quite rightly say we need to get this balance right. Yes. And the balance, therefore, is, is surely two things. One is what is the market implied rate, what is what you're saying, and also what is the impact of that rate for growth. Yes. Um, and do you not think that the likely, the likely way the market and others are going to read it is that actually rates need to come down so that we don't hit a, a bigger problem with recession. Well, the market is the market is essentially embodying in the in the curve that we will reduce interest rates during the course of this year. The, the timing of when they think we're going to make the first change has moved around a bit. It sometimes it's June, sometimes it's August. <coughs> Um, but they think we're going to cut rates uh, during the rest of this year. We do not uh, endorse the market curve. We are not making a prediction of you know, when or by how much. But I think you can, you, you know, you can tell from that, that profile of the forecast that it's, and, and again, compare it, as you rightly said, with the constant rate forecast, that it's not unreasonable for the market to think that. It's not unreasonable for the market to think that. Indeed, Andy Holding's remarks made that point, uh, as did the NIESR. Which you, you know, basically said in their report earlier this month that a little bit more forward guidance may have helped keep the UK out of technical recession. Do you think that had you given some forward guidance that you're closer to thinking in terms of where market rates might be as to where the bank rate might be might have kept us out of recession? I don't agree with that. Um, first of all, I mean, I was interested in, in, in the National Institute's overall summary of monetary policy because if you don't mind me quoting, I mean, what they said at the end of their commentary was, given geopolitical uncertainties, there should be no rush to cut rates quickly in 2024. Slow and steady will win the day. That was their, that's actually, I'm just quoting them now. Um, let, let me also go back to this point about the recession. Um, I mean, let's assume um, we would have had to be able to predict this recession of course, quite a way in advance of it actually happening, given the lags in the, in, in monetary policy. Um, and I don't think that's you know, given. Was your given forecast though? Wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, hang on, no, no, no. But that was. I mean, if you go back um, a year or more, we were forecasting a recession, but that was a different context. Remember, that was a context in which energy prices were very high. There were real concerns that we were going to run out of energy last winter. 
And of course, that turned around as well because energy, we didn't. Uh, we had a mild winter. Energy prices came down a lot, and we didn't forecast. Yeah, you know, we moved on from that forecast of recession. And that's just to emphasise that's a point about these are conditional forecasts. Sure. But, Governor, you are right exactly about what the NIESR said, but they also said, didn't they, that. Uh, the Bank of England say we will follow evidence and we'll take a decision when the time is right, whereas the Fed say we think rate cuts are likely during a given period. And I guess the point I'm making or trying to ask you about is that had you, if your guidance had been similar to the Fed's, might there have been less concern about, uh, about the recession? I'll come to Dr Broadbent in a moment because he's shaking his head very vigorously at the moment, but I'm <laughs> interested in the, vig the Governor's view. Well, okay, I'll start. Um, I think no central bank is currently predicting um, when they're going to make a rate cut. Um, they are predicting rate cuts. Well, some are, some aren't. Um, Jay Powell has. The Federal Reserve publishes what they call <coughs> dot plots, which, which show the, the, for, the forward predictions. But they change the dot plots. As, as Chair Powell has said many times, the, the, the dot plots change. The European Central Bank has been very clear that it, it, it very clear said in its most recent statement it's too soon to talk about interest rate cuts. So can I just emphasize, I mean, this whole question about forward guidance, I mean, we've, as I was saying when to the Chair's questions, we've changed what I would call our commentary to be very clear that, that now with the question is, for how long do we have to maintain the stance of policy before, and I would, you know, this, that means before we start to cut, in my view. So we've been very clear that's the framing, but I don't think any central bank that I know of is currently saying, and by the way, we will start the cuts in fill the month in. You want to... Uh, but, uh, and I guess, Dr. Prober, you're shaking your head because you're confirming the view you wrote about two years ago, where you were deeply sceptical about uh, giving. <coughs> well, I think the risk is always that people latch onto a particular date without reading the sort of the, the additional clause that's always there, including from the Fed or the ECB or anybody else, which is not we will do this at such and such a date. It's if such and such happens, then it's likely, you know, by such and such a date, then we may move accordingly. But it's always conditional. To my mind, one of the risks of that is people forget the if clause and just say they're going to cut in March or they're going to cut in May or whenever it is. Uh, no one gives an unconditional commitment to the future path of interest rates. And we have said, here are the things we're looking at. And if those move in a certain way, taken together, then yes, it's likely that uh, we can reduce the restrictiveness of policy. I don't see those two things as very different. I'm reminded of a very useful shorthand phrase the government adopted about the lifting of restrictions during the pandemic. It's data, not dates. And that's what we're looking at. And the other central banks are no different. And as for the effects of that, I think anything uh, that a central bank might say about the future path at rates that might in turn have an effect on the economy is embodied in the path of market expectations of rates. And if you look at the sterling curve, it fell during the course of the second half of last year by no less than the market curve of the Fed. So those monetary conditions ease, and they ease just as they had here, not actually in direct response to statements from central, by central bankers, but to the economic data. And we got declines in inflation, uh, larger declines than people were expecting here and in the US and indeed in Europe. And those are the things that drove down forward interest rates, whatever the statements from central banks. And I think that's a, a good thing to see markets behaving in that way and reacting to the data. On, and what we can do most usefully is say to people, here are the series we're interested in. Here are the things like we've been doing that might tell us about the persistence of inflation. And then you hope that markets pick up on that and respond to news in those series accordingly. And I think that's happened everywhere, regardless of any you know, small differences. And I, I don't agree with that statement that somehow, if, if I might, I might say something else, sorry, no, I've got the floor, about, um, quotes, recession. And I wanted to come back to something Andrew said a moment ago. And I do find this technical definition unhelpful, frankly. Um, if you go back to the decade before the financial crisis, a period of very good economic growth, Trend supply growth in the UK was, we think, close to 3% a year. 0.7% more than that per quarter. A zero is a long way from that. 
and you need quite a, a big departure from trend to get zero growth. We now think the trend supply growth is less than one. Indeed, productivity has fallen over the last year. And in that environment, you know, whether or not you happen to be technically plus 0.1 or minus 0.1 is, is, is a tiny difference, and it's much easier, as it were, just with the normal volatility of the data to get those numbers. If you look, uh, say, at how other countries define recession, in the United States, for example, where there's a separate body, the MBR, that says whether or not there has been a recession. One thing, by the way, is they wait quite a few <coughs> months before saying there was one. The data here can be revised. I was very... I remember well coming on to this committee when uh, I think I was early days when I was on the committee and there was a lot of excitement about the possibility of a triple dip recession. It turns out we didn't even have two dips because the numbers got revised. And uh, they also look at a much wider range of indicators. They don't just look at output growth, they look at employment. But effectively you're saying we need to look at series rather than one yeah, yeah. data. And so I think, I think, you know, that's I think the, the risk of this technical thing is people, you know, there's not some sudden discrete enormous difference that happens when you go from plus 0.1 to minus 0.1, especially in an environment of relatively weak. Does that trend. reflect the view that you're expecting? Uh, I, there must be the possibility of uh, revisions and or that you expect this to be very mild. Indeed. And uh, as Andrew said, employment has still been growing. We actually think... And I know the chairman's going to cut me off in a moment, I but I want, to, I want to ask Dr Green and Dr Dingle one question, please. Um, do you think that... I mean, we've, we've mentioned uh, dot plots. Do you think it would be helpful if members of the MPC were to set out forward dot plots like the Fed do, which highlight... Um, your, de your decision-making process on how rates should go in the future? I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that um, the markets probably don't understand the dot plots exactly as they're intended. So there is a challenge in um, how the dot plots are used for communication because it represents the median and the markets kind of take that as the Fed's forecast. That's, that's not what it is at all. That said, I have my own dot plot um, for the UK. I think we all have some version of our own dot plot. Um, and so they are useful for forcing you to be internally consistent about where you think are, things are heading. Um, they make you think about the medium term, which is appropriate given the lags in monetary policy. Um, but I also think in addition to communication issues, they're often viewed as a commitment. Um, and they're not a commitment, as Ben was saying, you know, there's always conditions that are put around it. And so I think they're problematic for that reason. I share the concerns regarding communication, particularly because we don't have the kind of sort of consensus view that, say, the other banks have. So I think there is a serious risk of not understanding which way the economy is headed. But that being said, I think what it does do is forces us to think about the medium term rather than focus just on the immediate policy decision. And I think that would be a useful feature of it. You're going to cut me off. <laughs> All right, I've used my right. time. Thank you. Um, Recognising that forecasts, uh, you know, to get them precisely right, is uh, <coughs> nigh on impossible. But what's an acceptable leeway, in your view? Well, I, don't, I don't think there is a statistical answer to that, I'm afraid, because, again, they are conditional forecasts, so it depends upon how the conditions move. Um, we're, we, are, we are in and have been in a period where the conditions have been moving in a much, you know, they've been much more volatile. So energy prices are a very good example of this. They've been much more volatile in recent times than they would normally be. So the, the, yeah, the, the error margins on any conditional forecast are that much larger as a result. I think if I could sort of continue with what, just pick up on what Swati was just saying. I, I mean, one of the questions that we have asked Ben Bernanke to look at in this context is how we present forecasts and how we use them because you know, we, you know, we use the forecast as what we call a best collective judgment but quite clearly you know, as you can tell from you know, things we say members can take different views on that and I think it's important that those views are, are transparent. So I think the question is is are there better ways of conveying the range of views than we have at the moment? I mean we, the moment we use the, the so-called fan chart to, to do some of that but I think there's a, there's a very open question here, which I think we will come to in the light of Ben Bernanke's report, which is, for instance, you know, if we were to use scenarios more, so in other words, present scenarios you know, around a forecast, would that help? And would it help with your question as well? Because given the inevitable uncertainty around this exercise, 
you know, we need to be able to convey more of the sort of the range of possible outcomes that we can have. You have seen some massive swings. Yes. And I guess the criticism is because you've got it so wrong two, two and a half years ago, you're now overcompensating the other way, which can lead to a strangling of aspects of the economy. And I guess it's that wide variation that is concerning when you also consider the impact of that has on pay demands, has on uh, other decisions which government and businesses both have to make on the basis of your forecasts, which then s tend to lose credibility. I think that's the fear um, factor that uh, just don't know where you're heading, coming back to the point, because you've got it so wrong in recent history. Well, can I, can I I'm afraid, come back to what we've discussed quite a few times, which is we, we have been living in a world of very big shocks, I mean, very big global shocks. So, yeah, obviously, COVID, um, Ukraine being obvious, obvious, the obvious ones. So when you say we got it... The core bank model itself, then, is um, itself poorly suited. Well, it doesn't predict wars, for instance. That's, it doesn't predict wars, it doesn't predict global pandemics. I mean, there isn't a model out there that will predict wars and global pandemics. Um, you know, we have to use the tools we have to respond as, you know, in the best way we do to, the impact, to our assessment of the impact of those shocks and how they're going to... Going, you know, going to wear through the system, as it were, and that's what we do. And whether, you know, one of the, question, the big questions that you know, we're keen to hear Ben Bernanke's views on is, well, are there tools that we can adopt or use tools differently uh, to help with that? But I'm afraid there isn't a model out there that will predict wars or, or pandemics. I understand on aspects of that. However, coming back to, I think, um, you in particular, Governor, but I'd be very interested to hear from Dr. Paul Bent and others, concerns about pay. Um, understandable uh, that we cannot uh, necessarily have an economy that continues just simply to see double digit um, uh, pay rises but you can anticipate why trade unions employers others will want to consider what the prospects of future inflation is in that determination mm. so um, for example would you um, do you think it was the wrong thing for the government to do to raise the living uh, wage by so much well, no, because I, I'm not going to. I, I think that's a that's a government policy that is done, you know, with good in, with good reason in terms of low pay. So I, I'm not going to comment on that. The questions we have to address in the context of that policy are really twofold. One is what is the impact of that policy, and it's not just the impact on on those who are directly affected by it, but also what is the impact in terms of the impact because obviously it has a sort of a an effect in terms of moving pay up, so it sort of compresses gaps between those who are affected by it and those who are above it. And we and I get a, you know we all I think we all go around the country a lot. I get a lot of commentary on it, and I go around the country. But I think the second point, and Ben, I think referred to it earlier, it's a question I always ask firms when they talk about this to me is. To what extent do you think you're going to be able to pass it on into prices? Because that's a key second leg uh, of, of, of that question. I would say that of late, I was on a visit last week actually, but, but of late over recent months, I think firms have been becoming more hesitant about their ability to pass on. So I'm certainly detecting that in the commentary. Um, but, but just on pay, you, you mentioned on pay January. I, the way I think you know it is working through at the moment, and what I you know, observe and I'm looking to see more of is that I think as headline inflation comes down, as people adapt their expectations of future inflation to that fall in headline inflation, which we are seeing in the short the, the, the surveys of inflation expectations that will feed through into pay bargaining that's what i would expect to see i think we're starting to see that happening um, and the question as we've all said i think in terms of what are we looking at going forwards is you know how how much and how quickly are we going to see that happen that's the question i think just thinking about the variety of judgments um that have to be made and considered um the internal members of the mpc seem to vote on block would it be better to just remove and just have the one vote from the internal members of the MPC okay. and then get the externality? <coughs> well, Because I'm not surprised that people will agree with their boss when they're in a, a meeting deciding interest rates, but uh, it, 
He does well there. Chrissy and Demet independently minded people, I can tell you. So I think. Well, you've all voted the same way. Well, I think. No, that's not true, actually. So I think in the last two years, I think 25% of the votes. The analysis by Treasury Select. No, no, it's not quite true. Well, in the last two years, I think 25, around about 25% of the meetings have had a, a, a split vote amongst the executive members. Um, now, I can, I can tell you that is, I think, a, a larger proportion than you see in other central banks around the world who reveal their votes. Um, so it's not quite true, actually. So, I mean, if you take the case, I mean, the, probably I think one of, the, one of the most significant votes we've had recently was last September when we decided to pause the, increase, the increases. That was, I think... You know, quite a quite a quite a critical moment, and, and and John Cunliffe dissented on that vote. He was an internal member. He dissented on that vote, and that's that's fine. I mean, I very strongly encourage the members of the MPC to you know to express their views because reasonable people can disagree on these things. And that's that's the, and we're about deliberating and then reaching reaching decisions. What's the outcome that you want to get to in the future, balancing your judgments? Um, you're saying it's not fair to try and say, of course, you can't predict wars and others. But the other main drivers of inflation are certainly within, should be within your modelling. Yeah. Well, as I said, I think we've, we've all said what we're now focused on is, is the more domestic things that we think will be the determinants of to what extent there is persistent inflation. So services pay, service inflation pay, quantities in the labour market. Um, I think we're seeing, you know, we are, as, as colleagues are saying, I think we're beginning to see the signs. You know, those are going in the right direction, but we need to see more evidence of that, and that's what I think, certainly speaking for myself, that's what, shape, what will shape my voting going forwards. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. Um, Governor, can I just press you a little bit on the risks of monetary policy being um, over tight? <coughs> and the implication this has on the economy and people generally. I mean, we all know in this room that, you know, these are very, very important decisions. It's affecting yes. people's livelihoods, um, cost of living crisis and so yeah. forth and all the rest of it. And, and, you know, a lot of people are having to tighten their belts at the moment and businesses yeah. accordingly. I mean, I put to you that, <clears throat> following on from your earlier comments, you can't predict these things precisely, but what we have at the moment is an economy, um, very pedestrian growth, bordering recession. We have interest rates at five and a quarter percent. Your favourite measure, CPI, is trending downwards. It's, you're, you're very, you know, made that very clear and should hit its target by the end of this year, if not before. You've got an easing and tightness in the labour market evidence. You've got evident. You've got a deceleration in retail good prices that you believe has further to go. Why aren't you cutting rates now? Why aren't you looking forward and not back and realising that actually a lot of the indicators that you have quoted in the past, you and the MPC, are actually flashing red when it comes to cutting interest rates? Well, can I just reset the point you made about where CPI is going to? Yeah, the, the projection we produced um, suggests it will go to target, we think, in the spring of this year, but it won't stay there. By the, actually, the projection we have, by the end of the year, it's around two and three quarter percent. And that's because these temporary effects wear off. So it's not back at target at the end of the year on, on that projection. Now, it, clearly it's in a much better place than it was, um, but our job is to have it sustainably at target. And that's why we are looking very carefully at the indicators we've, we, we've emphasized. Because as the question, is, as, as Ben, I think, put it, um, is for how long do we need to keep policy restrictive to be confident that it's not just going to settle at two and three quarter percent, it's on the, it's on the sustainable path to two percent. And that's the judgment that we, we've got to make. Just, We're not just, there yet. We're not there yet. Okay. I take, I take that point. <coughs> you, you, th you see a, a, a tick up in CPI. You've made it clear you don't think it's going to be very pronounced, but you still see a tick yeah. up. That's, I accept that. But to counter that, I would suggest to you that, you know, the full effects of the interest rate rises so far have not been f f felt by the economy. I think your, your own report said that only about two-thirds of peak domestic impact of higher interest rates on the level of, of GDP has now come through. Mm. I point towards, I, I suggest to you mortgage increases is a good example of that. We know when the interest rate rises started, something like three-quarters, around three-quarters of mortgages were fixed rate. Um, on average, over the next three years, 
despite interest rates falling, we think, and inflation falling, mm -hmm. there's still going, you're still going to see a 39% increase on average, um, your stability report suggested, um, over the next three years, in increase in payments. Um, these are indicators that are suggesting that there are countervailing for counterbalancing forces to this modest tick up in CPI that you need to focus on, isn't it? Well, we focus a lot, and I can tell you, we spend a lot of time during the round that we do to, to, to determine the, the decision on this question about what we call the monetary transmission mechanism, or the pasture, as you say. So I think it's useful to illustrate that with the round we've just had. If you go back to November, our staff told us that they thought about 50% of the pass-through had occurred. As you said a minute ago, by this, by this round, the February round, they had revised that view to about 70%, so just a little bit above two-thirds, as you said. There's two reasons why that happened. One, there was some passage of time. Um, but two, more importantly, the, the interest rate curve had come down, as we were saying earlier. And that means that actually the, the total pass-through will be less uh, than we thought it would be, because mortgage rates, for instance, have come down. Um, and therefore, more, but given what's already come through, it's a greater proportion of the total. So that's why we've got to 70. And we factor that in. That's, a, that's a, you know, something that we take a, spend a lot of time considering and take into consideration. So we do factor these things in. It's not, uh, not something we ignore at all. I press you on the issue of the, the modelling because, uh, just following on from Theresa's point, I mean, th there is, and now you know that we've raised this with you before when we came to see you in the Bank of England, for example, mm. and had that evidence session. There is a concern out there that, that the MPC has been behind the curve. It was behind the curve on the way up. Of course, no model can predict um, shocks, external shocks, but it doesn't get away from the fact, one small example, that, you know, just before the Ukrainian... Ukraine rebel, um, invasion, war in Ukraine. Um, mortgage um, interest rates were still around half a percent. Inflation was rising and had hit 6% before the war. In other words, I put it to you that you were behind the curve then. That is now history. What is important in look, is looking forward. I'm suggesting likewise that there's a real risk here that you're behind the curve again on the way down. Can I just, can I, you, I, I'll quote something back at you if you don't mind, Andrew. Um, you, you were in the front of the House of Lords. Um, reference was briefly made about models. Mm. And you, you've clearly said we have a number of models and none of them are frankly achieving things we have much confidence in. You then go on and quote and say the tools have not served us particularly well. No. Accepting that, in all humility, and I commend you for this, um, <coughs> accepting that, should you not be earing up on the side of caution when it comes to over-tightening and starting to cut rates now when all the indicators, or most of them, are pointing in that direction? Well, can I... Uh, my response to that is that I think you know, we have moved on quite decisively, our, you know, the stance we're taking and, and how we're communicating it. This is my point I made earlier about moving from, I said we've moved from the question of how restrictive does policy need to be to for how long does it need to be restricted. And that was very clear because it, it was a very clear, if you like, sort of in a sense moving towards anticipating the point when we will be lowering interest rates. But if you don't mind me saying so, I remember back in this hearing last May, you suggested to me, and I didn't disagree with you that much, that you thought we would get inflation would get stuck at 4%. And, and I said, I can see why, I think I said at the time, I can see why you're making that point, because at that time we were very worried about persistence. Now, I think those, those, those concerns, yeah, we've moved on, those concerns have eased somewhat. I think we're probably both of us, take it from what you're saying, recognize that. But we're still at a point when we have to see the convincing evidence that we're going to come sustainably back to 2%, because we've still got services inflation at over 6%. So we've got, we've got quite a wide dispersion of the components of inflation at the moment from that figure I was giving for household energy, which is, you know, might be heading down to minus 25, to services at, at over 6. And it's particularly given that the minus 25 will not, be, will not persist, it's those persistent elements that we need to see, I think, more progress on. That's, that's the judgment that we have to make. Can I just add something here as someone who grew up in the U.S. in the 1980s, um, that given the uncertainty that the governors um, referenced, there's also a risk that you end up easing too quickly and then having to reverse 
track um, and hike even more in the end, therefore leaning on growth even more. I think, to my mind, that's the worst scenario, actually. And so I think it's worth highlighting that risk, just given the uncertainty. And that's why I, in particular, you know, I'm looking for more signs that uh, persistence is less embedded than we had initially feared before thinking about cutting. Yes, but I, I would suggest that if recent history would suggest that if you look at the rate increases at the end of 21, we were, the Bank of England was catching up. Um, inflation, I think, got higher than it should have done because it, there was a process of catching up. And I, what I'm suggesting to, to the panel this morning is that you know, we have an admission that the modelling is not what it should be. We know forecasting is, uh, is under scrutiny and its usefulness. We have lead indicators suggesting that the economy is still, um, how can I put it, lead indicators suggesting that inflation is coming down and will continue to do so, and still the full lag of past interest rate rises not being felt, let alone them being felt in the mortgage market. Given all that, given where inflation is now and where interest rates are now, why not cut? Um, you can't get it always right. Coming back to your point, Megan, if there is a tick up, then you can judge that situation at the time. But I suggest to you that the risks are on the downside when it comes to inflation, and the bank is not responding. And businesses are suffering out there. People are suffering out there because interest rates are too high. Now, all the evidence suggests, despite this slight tick up in energy that, that you are forecasting for CPI, that the indi lead indicates suggesting inflation is coming down. It's coming down fast. Now, why isn't the bank responding more? Well, can I go back to a point I made early on? Um, we are, and as I said, this is, this is a good part of the story, but we have to deal with you know, We have to manage through it, which is you say all the lead, indi lead indicators are coming down, and we actually are still operating, as I said, in, in what we think is pretty much full employment. So we have a tight labour market, but it remains tight. Now, I say I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see that change particularly in the sense that I don't, you know, nobody wants to create unemployment. But we are having to manage this disinflation process in that context, which is fine. I mean, we will do that. But it does mean that we have to be you know, very alert to those sets, okay, those right. domestic indicators. I because got those are things longer. that are going to determine the persistence of inflation. Okay. But you've, you, your own report has suggested that easing, that there's evidence of easing and the tightness in the labour market. I mean, the other indicators one hasn't mentioned is quantitative tightening. Um, you know, the report is, uh, the, the committee is concerned about this being a bit of a leap in the dark. I mean, m there's no doubt about it that money growth remains well below historical averages. Now, I know the bank always, hasn't always um, you know, attached a lot of importance to money supply figures. I think there are two paragraphs on money supply in the latest report, you know, which is more than there's been in the past. But there is, I would suggest, a correlation between money supply and inflation. But even those figures are coming down. I mean, let me just finish oh. with this question. Well, sorry, go on. You finish. Take on if you want. Can I just make a point on that, which I made, I made to the House of Lords last week. When, yeah. It's a chart that we have in the, in, the, in the monetary policy report. Actually, one of the things that I find useful is to look at the stock of, I mean, let's look, stock of, the stock of household M4 to nominal income. It is now back to, back to its pre-COVID trend. Mm. Now, the question is what happens next. I agree with you. I mean, that's the point. But yeah. what we've seen so far is essentially taken it back to its uh, pre-COVID trend. Okay. Does Dr. Broadbent and Dr. Dingro want to say anything about this? On money specifically? Yes, on the risk of, of, of um, money, uh, of you know, interest rates being overly restrictive. Yeah, clearly there's a risk. I mean, there's also a risk they're not sufficiently. There are two of us who voted for still higher interest rates. Mm. I, don't, I don't agree that all the evidence is one direction. I mean, in my experience, and I've been doing this quite a while now, that's never the case. Mm. It is never the case that every lead indicator points in the yeah, same direction. A good number of them, if not yeah, the majority. Number, indeed. And um, clearly we've made good, good progress. I should point out that a lot of that good progress, by the way, is precisely the unwinding of the pandemic effects. You referred to 6% inflation. That was caused by these huge rises in core goods prices, tradable prices after the pandemic. So it's not just the war. Pandemic caused inflation in no, 2020. My point Thanks, was, but can actually, I just finish the answer? So I don't say that. And there was a view at the time amongst all central banks that that would prove, quote, transitory 
and although it's taken longer, I think, than the central bank, that has proved to be the case. Most of the disinflation we've had, um, in fact, all of it over the last year, has been in tradable prices, either yeah. energy or tradable goods. What we are now, those things are pretty volatile. They've been enormously volatile over the last three years, and um, even if they don't prove transitory in the space of a year, they, those movements tend to last less long in general than the lag. Uh, it, we need before a policy decision has its peak okay. impact on inflation. Hang on. So what we are looking at, as we've all said, is these more persistent things. And I agree there would have been some encouraging news there as well. But I don't think it's the, true to say that you know it's all clearly pointing in the same direction. We've got services inflation over six. We've got wage growth of over six. Those are probably both of them almost twice the rates we think are consistent with a stable Final inflation question. target. So we have to take a, a, a view on the balance of these risks. So, of course, it's absolutely true to say that the risk there's over-tightening. There's also a risk of too little. And every round we meet, we try and balance those two things. You have an insight. Dr. Well, I would just add to that that there, there are risks on both sides to some degree, but in my view... I don't want to earn the side of over-tightening for the reason that that could come with a hard landing, which we've mm. up till now, you know, fortunately avoided, and also because that then risks damaging supply capacity in a more long-lasting way. Mm. Thank you. Final question. Um, we've raised this issue with the MPC before as a committee, and that is groupthink. Mm. And I know that the voting split was, was more pronounced this, on this last occasion and in a way that is welcome, particularly for those who, who worry about the risk of over-tightening. Um, are you going to address this issue of groupthink? Because there is a concern that it does exist, not just with the Bank of England, but with, with perhaps other central banks at all. Um, let me give you one example. In the <clears throat> probably the most passionate economic debate we've had for a generation, i.e. whether or not to leave the EU, Brexit basically, um, those that have declared on the MPC have all, were all on the side of Remain. There is no evidence of anybody actually saying Brexit was a good idea. That is one small example of where I think there may be an element of group think. Would, do you think that's unfair or not? Well, I've been very clear for the last um, eight years that as a public official I do not take a position on Brexit per se, and I think that is... The right thing at to you do. When I was saying that. So I'm afraid, you know, I'm in the class. You can't. I'm afraid you can't pin a view on me because I've been very clear that I do not, as a public official, take a view on Brexit. I think it is very important that we are objective in assessing the economic, uh, you know, consequences and the economic issues around Brexit, and you know, we have, we have provided, you know, our assessment where it's appropriate. And I think that's the. I, I have to say, I've, I've, I feel very, very fervently that's the right way to do it. I don't think the right way to do it is to say, let's have a few, of, let's have a few of everything on on the committee. I think we are we are you know, public officials in that sense. You're doing all you can to ensure that that, that that putting Brexit to one side, that you address this central concern about groupthink. Well, I mean, you would you would probably wouldn't have brought in Ben Bernanke if you hadn't. That's what one of his briefs. <coughs> well, first of all, I mean. Uh, I think, as, as you yourself said, you can tell from the voting on the MPC that there's not much evidence of groupthink in terms of the, the outcomes of the MPC. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting question, I agree with you, which, again, the House of Lords has raised with me in the past, which is, is there a sort of deeper groupthink in the economics world? And I think, um, first of all, by the way, I mean, Ben Bernanke is one of the most eminent economists in the world, so I don't think we can sort of, you know, have any, any question around the, you know, his approach to that. I think... It's always important that we, you know, are you know, take on board and you know, new thinking and the discipline. And it's always important that the discipline doesn't become sort of, in a sense, you know, single-minded in terms of how it approaches these questions. And we all have a part to play in that. I think you're right on on that point. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you all for coming today. I found the tenor of this conversation a little bit interesting in the sense that we've had a few mentions of the 1970s today, but it feels like you guys have been in the, un in the unenviable position of unpicking a barbaresque kind of dash for growth over the last two years and are now getting criticised for why you're not unpicking it quickly enough, but that's maybe a discussion for another time. Um, in, re in relation to fiscal events kind of coming down the track this year, Governor, 
Is the bank anticipating tax cuts either in the spring budget or in pre-election fiscal events this we, year? We never anticipate any fiscal policy. I mean, we wait for fiscal policy to be announced. So the, um, the, yeah, the, the report we've just produced and the forecast we've just published takes on board the autumn statement. It doesn't make any uh, antici anticipatory uh, judgment as to what might be to come. If you're in a situation, though, where there are still lots of fluctuations in energy prices, the outlook for inflation is kind of unclear over the mm. course of the year, and you know that tax cuts have the potential of coming down the track based on reporting that we've seen, is there any sort of view as to whether tax cuts in the form in which they're reported now could be inflationary? Well, I, I, I'd be a bit cautious about that. First of all, we have to obviously see you know, what they actually are. Let me I mean, give you the example of the, of the autumn statement, because we covered this in the report. So I would say that the measures that the Chancellor introduced in the autumn statement, and you know, by the way, we, you know, we do obviously talk to the OBR a lot, and we use some of their methodology. Um, our assessment is that they do have a positive effect on GDP, but they don't have much effect on inflation. And the reason for that is because um, we think that there is also a supply side benefit from them, particularly in the labour market measures, the welfare and labour market measures, bringing more people into the labour force. So actually our judgment at the end of the day and what our staff proposed to us was that the inflation impact of the August statement was very small, if, if, if really, not, not, really not, not really registering much. For that reason, that of course, we have to take on board not only the demand consequences, but also the supply consequences, because that's what matters for us. And in relation to kind of decision making on the MPC, where you look into an election year where not only do you not know what will be in the contents of the spring statement, but you also don't know when the general election will be. I was hoping you were going to tell us, somebody will tell us. But oh, no, but if anybody else wants to enlighten me, I'd be, I'd no, be more than happy. Yeah. This year, well. Before next February. Yes. Um, do you feel as though members of the MPC might be hedging in their decision to not reduce interest rates because effectively, because of the spring budget, tax cuts are a known unknown in regard? No. No, that's, that, that's very definitely not part of our, um, our thought process. Um, you know, we condition on what we know. We do not um, anticipate things, whether they be fiscal policy statements, and we don't anticipate the election. The election will happen when it happens from, a, from our perspective. That's, that's not part of the decision-making process. Well, are there circumstances then in which you feel like the bank would have to maintain the rate in order to offset a potential inflationary impact of tax cuts from a fiscal Well, I, I, I really honestly can't, you know, prejudge what the what the budget's going to contain. What we always do is once the budget is announced, the Chancellor's made a statement, we've talked to the OBR, of course, on their analysis, we will factor it in. So the main, the main monetary policy report will, will have all of that in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so in an FT article last week, the sources close to the Chancellor suggested that Treasury officials were considering reducing projected departmental spending rises to around 0.75% a year due to tax cuts. We spent a lot of time in recent weeks on the committee talking about macro prudential risk, but does the bank take a view or have an assessment on what the impact of real terms departmental spending cuts could be on factors like labour market participation or business investment and their concurrent impact on growth? No, um, we use, uh, so I mean, once it's all announced, we, tend, we use the OBR's um, sort of costing and um, <laughs> you know, impact methodology for that. We don't have our own because the OBR will have gone through that in great detail, so they will have assessed all these sort of very sort of detailed measures. And when we, our staff, who talk to the OBR a lot, but we essentially take that as, as, as our basis. And in relation to the OBR's assessment of the impact of the autumn statement, to what extent do your projections match with the OBR? Very closely, very okay. closely, yeah. And I, I'd also just like to pick up on something that the Chancellor said in May last year about him being comfortable with the notion of a recession in order to get inflation down to target. What is the perspective of members on this committee as to whether a recession is sort of a, a necessary evil when it comes to getting inflation down in the long term? Well, we're not seeking a recession. I mean, let's be, I think I have to be very clear on that at that point, because we don't target growth in that sense. You know, we're targeting inflation. Um, Obviously, we provide forecasts. They give you know, our assessment as to what the growth profile is going to be consistent with that path of inflation. And as the chair said earlier, I mean, there was a point in time going back about 15 months or so when we were forecasting a recession because of the situation, <laughs> in, in, particularly in energy markets. Um, so yeah, our position is very clearly. We're not seeking a recession, definitely not. Um, but we're not t we don't forecast or target what well, we do forecast, sorry. But we're not targeting growth in that sense. 
on this point. Therese, did you have a question? Can I just clarify a couple of things? Um, you say you don't forecast fiscal events. No. But I think in a different aspect of um, evidence or analysis being shared by select committee staff, you are assuming that the fuel duty escalator will kick mm. back in and therefore that will drive inflation. So help me understand that, given that certainly I think it's since uh, well over a decade, fuel duty yes. escalator has not been. Mm. So, so why don't you learn in terms of how much judgment gets put on your hands. Well, By the way, Dr Broadbent has voted consistently with the Governor for, I believe, according to the analysis, every single meeting he's ever been at and discussing interest rates. So, so why, don't, why don't you do think, that, think a bit more? Well, uh, it's, look, well, it's, what it's the, a uh, really, uh, it's a good... Oh, I'm just trying to think how it's connected it, with the field. <laughs> <laughs> look, it's, it's... Because you talk about judgment that you bring and then you say, but uh, we wait until something is announced, and yet you don't use yeah. Yeah. that, but you're saying, well, we can't do that because that will drive yeah. inflation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, there, we base the forecast on announced fiscal policy, and announced fiscal policy says, yes, we plan to raise the fuel duty. There is an alternative universe where we forecast fiscal policy, and those forecasts, I can think of a particular example when the forecast undoubtedly would have been much better in a sort of objective sense of you know, a, a less conditional view of the future. Um, going back to February 21, I think it was when um, lockdown had happened but the furlough scheme had not yet been extended. And we were faced with a situation where the announced fiscal policy was to end the furlough scheme but I think pretty much everyone knew that it would be extended. So if we decided, and it, as a practice, we said, yeah, let's forecast fiscal policy. Um, there are occasions when the forecast would be better. I mean, I don't, as it happens, the fuel duty escalator is, has a small effect. I don't think it would have much effect at the medium term, which is more relevant for our decisions. So I don't think it'd be that material for, for monetary policy. My own view is that that would be a bad state of affairs and that if we came before this committee, you would be asking us all the time what our forecasts for fiscal policy are. I think it's much better that we take a more neutral approach and we base the forecast on announced policy, even to take your example, if it may well turn out to be the case that for another year it's not imposed, it is the case that that is the announced intention and the plan. And even if more generally there are occasions when we'd end up with a better forecast, I don't think it would be the right thing, sort of constitutionally, as it were, for us to start forecasting fiscal policy. I mean, the awkwardness, it's a really good question. But the awkwardness is that state and government policy is at odds with practice. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and there's a tension in there. I mean, yeah. Thanks. I have one other question. I mean, Mr. Mather has suggested that. Uh, trying to grow the economy is what's led to the in huge inflation. It's been external factors, which you've already said to the committee. So um, just tell me a little bit more about, in terms of the predictions, f there is going to be an election this year, but tell me where you think the biggest change in tax cut or increase in spending could make a difference to the growth of the economy. I, I passed over the barber boom comment because I wasn't sure, with all respect, that I think it's actually central to the, <laughs> central to the analysis. All right. Anne-Marie. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Unemployment, as opposed to people who are not seeking work. Uh, Dr. Broadbent, earlier on, you suggested that this is going to be a very difficult um, issue, mm -hmm. and that currently distinguishing between the two is hard. It's, it's relatively easy to work out who's employed. You can talk to an employer. Yeah. Somebody who's not seeking work is very hard, and the ONS have said they're going to look again at a different way of dealing with this. Given that challenge, which seems to be right now intractable, and given how important wage growth and your predictions as to whether it's going to go up or down impacts what your decision will be come, come breaks, come next time around, how robust is your view that employment will rise four to five percent by the end of the period i'm just trying to get a, a steer as to how yes. given all of those uncertainties and given how important wage growth is 
how you're going okay. to ad address yes. that when you start sorting out the next rate rise or fall. Well, there's no doubt that you know it's an additional uncertainty, and as you say, uh, we will in time have an improved uh, survey of the labour market of households, the transformed LFS. Um, but that's some months away yet. Um, the ONS has said they're not now planning to launch it until, I think, September. Um, and you're also right to say that it's um, more of an issue for us than the uncertainties about the level of employment because we have these other indicators. Just a couple of points about wage growth specifically. One, regarding the tightness of the labour market, we do have a few things. Andrew referred to the suite of models, and we have a graph of those. Um, actually, the one, which I'm not sure is in that suite, actually, that has performed best over the last couple of years is one that has vacancies in it. I mean, formally, the ratio of vacancies to unemployment, so the rate of unemployment still matters for that. But vacancies, a few other indicators of labour market tightness, you can ask. There's a question in a couple of business surveys about the availability of labour, our own agents ask their contacts about that question. And those have proved quite useful as well. So I don't think uh, we're, you know, we have no other indicators to tell us about that sort of pressure, um, even if I agree that there's a little more uncertainty than usual. And, you know, you look at the forecast for unemployment, we're the big fat fan around them. Just one final point about wage growth, um, and it's true that the slack in the labour market does matter a lot and it's you know one central means or channel through which monetary policy works for example actually i think the bigger influence over the last two years has simply been spot inflation all these global shocks that we've been talking about and those drove the vast majority of the upward moves in inflation and they've driven just about all of the moves down from the peak over the last year and you know, perhaps for our short-run expectations for households, those have been the biggest influence. So our expectation that wage growth will continue to fall is mainly the result of the declines in spot inflation that we're getting from drops in core goods inflation, drops in energy inflation. That's not to deny that we still have uncertainty about the, the rest of the determinants, including slack in, slack in the labour market. But for my part, I feel you know, reasonably confident that wage growth will edge down a little further over the next few months. Um, but I don't deny that, you know, um, it makes life a little harder when we're not exactly sure what the, you know, current rate of unemployment is. Ms Green, how do you feel about this, particularly given your insights as to... Please don't worry goes, about the bell. OK. ..what goes on in the US? because clearly the trend post-COVID here has been very different to the US and indeed a number of other markets. In the US we saw um, a number of um, women coming into the market that hadn't been in work before. We saw people with disabilities coming into the market, another group it's very hard to identify. <coughs> so do you share uh, Dr Broadbent's how should I put it? Concerned, but not over concerned, or you were a bit more concerned about the robustness, given how important where the labour market is going and, and particularly wages. Do you feel making your decision, you really are going to be in a position to make it with all the evidence you need or enough? Yeah, so I think uncertainty around the data certainly produces uncertainty for us. But I will highlight that while we don't have fantastic data on inactivity versus unemployment. Actually, there is a lot of data in the UK that isn't provided elsewhere on participation. Um, so, you know, people are asked in surveys here, why aren't you in the labor market? Um, and they can say long-term sickness. Actually, the UK is a real front runner on this. You can't replicate that data anywhere else. So that does provide some details on, on the participation rate, the labor supply, why people might not be coming back into the labor market. So that's given us a bit of a steer. Um, and then I guess in terms of how this all impinges on wage growth and therefore yeah. my monetary policy stance, I would reiterate the point that Ben's made, which is the biggest driver um, of wage growth over the past couple of years has been inflation expectations. And we know that following a huge energy shock, like the UK has seen, inflation expectations tend to be backwards looking. 
Um, and so that amplifies second round effects because everybody's more sensitive to the original shock. Given that's the case, if inflation's coming down, inflation expectations should continue to come down along with it, and that should take some upward pressure off of wage growth. So I feel um, reasonably sure that we're headed in the right direction. We're still well above levels that are target consistent, but at least the trend is in the right direction. Okay, so uh, Dr. Dinger, are you in agreement that wages are coming down and you have enough, given all of the uncertainties we've talked about? I think the drop in vacancies that we have seen is much higher than anywhere else in the euro area or in the US. And I take a slightly different view, though, on inactivity. I think the issue that you bring up is really important, but much more from a productivity point of view than a wage growth point of view. And particularly if you look at the finer data till the point when it was available to us, the inactivity numbers, what it showed was that there was a lot of heterogeneity regions that saw an increase in inactivity and those that didn't. It was typically poorer people, lower income people who were seeing more rise in inactivity. And it wasn't at that point that wages were really rising more in those areas where you were seeing higher inactivity happen. So I don't think of it as wage inflationary necessarily. These tend to be more depressed areas where you see this sort of issue arise more. And instead, I see it more as a really serious productivity issue. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Um, I am now going to come to Danny. Great. Thank you very much. Just to continue the conversation about global shocks and the effect on, on our inflation forecasts. And I, I mean, I echo the comments made by colleagues here and Andy Haldane and others that we do, in my view, risk uh, choking off our, our recovery if we don't see rates come down soon. But what, of course, remains the great unknowable is the effect of global events. And I want to just pro uh, ask a bit more deeply into why in your view, although there is this obviously concern about uh, uh, cutting rates too soon, uh, we're not more worried, or you're not more worried about what's going on in the Red Sea. Uh, you know, we've had we've got to see thirty percent of the glo of the world's container ships effectively, uh, you know, having to take the long way round. Um, and I recognise that we haven't seen a, what might have been expected in terms of falls in energy prices and and wider goods prices as a result, but uh, should we be not be more concerned, particularly if that conflict persists, as it, as it seems likely to do? And specifically, and if you're going to answer that the energy futures market seems uh, robust and isn't predicting falls, what do you say to the suggestion that that's because of uh, the distortions caused by algorithmic traders who are exaggerating the trends? that we're seeing at the moment. You know, we've had this warm winter. The bots are basically reinforcing current uh, practice rather than being a proper indicator of future prices. Is there not a risk that we are betting on these, uh, these, these distorting algorithmic trades that are going on rather than having a real estimate of what might be happening in the energy market in the future? Well, um, we talk a lot to those who are directly in the energy market. I, I mean, try and sort of various parts to that question. I'll try and split it out. On energy itself, um, I mean, you're right, and as I observed earlier, we've, you know, we've had a second uh, you know, warm winter in succession. At the moment, and we're, you know, we're obviously, as, as, as Dame Angela was saying, we're well through the winter and spring's beginning to appear. Um, you know, storage levels for gas are, remain at high levels, so it looks like we're going to be coming out of another winter, heading into heading into the next one with, with, with higher storage levels. The point that's been put to me a number of times by producers on that front is that um, there is a sort of window that we have to get through before the world supply, particularly of liquefied natural gas, expands, the infrastructure to supply it expands. People have talked to me about needing that, that running through to next year and possibly 2026. And that's the period that you know, there, is a, there is a concern about the world gas market. But of course, we've, we've just been do dealt an enormous you know, benefit by the weather. Now, that doesn't get us all the way there, but that's the, you know, that's the sort of analysis that you get from people who are saying, I don't think they're running bots. I think they're actually in, you know, they're in the energy supply business. On the Red Sea, I mean, I, 
Look, I agree with you, and that's why we've we, you know, we've got an explicit risk in the in in, <coughs> in the projection to to, to to reflect this. There is an upside. There's a temporary upside risk to inflation um, in our forecast uh, to reflect what what dis disruption from the Red Sea. The point I th I think is the case is that is that the Suez Canal is more used for goods than it is for oil. So the, the, the redirection is more of a goods thing than an oil thing, particularly. And it is certainly the case, and we do factor this, our staff, you know, our staff take a lot of time over this, and we do factor this, is that shipping costs have gone up. Not, nothing like what the rate they went up during the post, sort of in the COVID period, the COVID recovery period. But we do factor that in. So, I, look, I agree with you. I mean, I, you know, I heard you say the other day in a hearing that I was rather sanguine about this. I'm not sanguine. I mean, the fact is, you know, we, we've had some, you know, some things go our way, as it were, collectively, it seems to me. But this thing is a... A terrible risk out there, and I mean, these events are terrible events. I think there is, I mean, I talk to a lot of people in, in, the, in the oil supply business, and I think what I take from what they say is, particularly in the Middle East, is you know, there is a desire to keep the oil price stable. Um, there is a point beyond which, with this conflict, as they always say to me in rather sort of serious tones, that will not be possible, but we haven't reached that point. Mm, okay. um, so, but we have to be concerned that, that you're right, that risk exists. Yeah. Can, can I just add to that briefly, um, because I spend a lot of time talking to global supply chain logistics companies, um, including one in Billericay, actually, recently on an agency visit. But it seems like the consensus... Part of the globe, actually. <laughs> well, there was one. Um, <laughs> But it seems there is a general consensus. So as you know, we're making policy based on what will happen um, further out in the medium term. Um, and there's a general consensus that the capacity of global um, containers is due to increase significantly over the next couple of years. And so while a lot of ships are having to go the long way around, which represents a supply um, constraint, actually a lot of supply will be coming online. So that over the medium term, that might offset some of that. Okay, okay. One additional, okay. sorry to jump in again, but additional point is, and we think about what the extra costs are, and we can, people tell us what they are to go you know, around the yeah. Cape rather than, but in the background, at least over the, and the, I think this is a, a, will be the dominant effect, absent some other huge shock, um, You've had these big falls, um, or certainly declines over the last 18 months in the underlying producer prices, the wholesale prices of, of tradable goods. Yes. This is something that Swati referred to earlier. Yeah. The connection with the unwinding of the pandemic effects, probably starting in the summer of 22, actually, the wholesale prices, the manufacturer's output prices globally started to fall. Not hugely, but they've declined even here. Uh, in China, for example, the numbers are quite quite negative, okay. and compared mm -hmm. with the additional costs of the shipping, those are much bigger. Okay. So I think that's why, at least you know, in our central forecast, we had core goods inflation which peaked at I think something like eight, and it's now come down, and we have it going almost to zero next spring. I mean that's helpful. Thank you. And I mean it's good, it's, it's, it's good to hear that there is uh, th that kind of analysis going on. I do worry when I hear analysis based on the. Uh, simply on what the futures market seems to be saying. Just quickly on that, Megan, maybe I'll ask, ask you this, just going back to my anxiety about algorithms. As I understand it, 70% of daily crude trades are basically automated. Do you not, are you not concerned about the, the sort of herd mentality of the machine uh, exaggerating existing trends? Or do you think that's, that's all okay? Why would it be, if you say, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why it would be more so in these markets than, I mean, any other markets. Algorithmic trading is clearly growing. I mean, the use of AI is growing. We, you know, putting our other hat on as a regulator and financial yeah. stability, and we, you know, we do follow this quite closely. I'm not, do you think it's more pronounced in this area than... Um, I'm just, I, well, my concern is that we are betting a lot on it. Uh, mm. And when we have the Chancellor in here often say, you know, and we've had him in here before saying, giving his predictions on, when, in fact, indeed, when uh, we were being told inflation was transitory some a couple of years ago, it was because of the sense that the futures market and energy was bullish. And, and I'm concerned if we are betting on, a, on technology that is designed to pursue quite short-term uh, information and to exaggerate the trends that currently exist, rather than making... Actually, you've just been explaining, I think, much more intelligibly why we should have confidence that energy prices are going to 
continue to fall. I worry a bit about the degree to which we rely on automation uh, in this market. Uh, Sorry, can I come in on this point? When I came in and joined the MPC, this was one of the key debates that was happening because energy futures curves were being used to condition our forecasts. And I think there was a great sense of caution about that, as well as judgment was put on not to rely solely on the futures market curves, not simply because of the algorithmic trading that you're referring to, but these also happen to be very thin markets. So you really are basing your judgment on something which is really, you know, there's not much data to back right. it. And they've been very, and they've been very volatile yeah. recently. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Can I move on and feel free, anyone, this is to the panel in general. Um, there seems to be a difference of opinion between different central bankers about what might be the inflationary consequences of a persistent or worsening situation in the Middle East, with the ECB suggesting that actually the effect of, uh, of, of, of persistent conflict would have a dampening effect on confidence globally, um, whereas, of course, the more obvious direct effect would be an increase in mm. oil prices. What, is there a collective view on which, which side we should lean in our predictions there? Yeah, this is a, what, I mean, an over-technical language, of course, a trade-off inducing shock, yeah. because it yes. probably, to varying degrees, have both those effects. I think all one could say, at least my feeling about it, is and this is what we've tried to do over the last couple of years, and specifically in response to the enormous hit to energy prices as a result of the war, which is that we're less focused on those direct impacts than we are on the, quote, second round effects, uh, than we would be, put it that way. Now, even then, there's a trade-off, because, as we've discussed earlier, you know, domestic inflation of wages and services prices might respond to higher headline inflation, but equally it reduces people's real incomes and that <laughs> might depress spending. So I, I, I don't want to know if I would be willing to give a definitive answer about which of those would win out. But my answer is I think both would happen and we could only judge the situation in real time as to what the appropriate response of policy should be. Indeed, both those things happened in in uh, during 2022. Yes. Um, yes. Now, in the event, we tightened policy pretty aggressively because we had the pandemic effects plus the war, and there were a lot of second round effects. But in principle, I think both those things are true, and that's one of the difficulties in deciding how you respond to these things. Any other thoughts on that? No, I think that's fair that, that we'll probably see, if, if this were prolonged or were to expand beyond, um, you know, tradable goods into energy, I think we would be in trade-off territory where it would probably put some upward pressure on prices and it would probably put some downward pressure on demand. Okay. Um, I'd actually add to that yes, that please. I think the supply-side pressure on prices is probably going to be the first thing that hits and that's why we would probably need to be cautious about inflation spiking up again. Okay. Um, that's probably my time up, isn't it? Or have I got time for one last quick question? You can ask one more. One quick question. I mean, this is a, this, this is a uh, perhaps for you, Governor. Is it, if, um, if, inf if, if inflation were to rise again, and you're suggesting there will be a slight rise again towards the end of the year, um, uh, but if, it, if there is persistent inflationary effects from the global situation, does it automatically follow uh, that rates would have to rise again? Um, given the degree to which, as we've all been acknowledging, inflation has largely been the consequence of global shocks. And I appreciate we have to have a domestic response to it, but oh. the extent to which monetary policy will substantially affect inflation in the UK uh, is questionable given the degree to which it's, it's caused by these, by, by, by import prices. So do you, do, would you expect to see rates go up again if we see? Well, I, I think Ben says it out very well, actually. I mean, I, I was sorry, I was smiling initially because I, I thought, well, we're back into transitory territory at that. I mean, in the sense of judging the, the shocks in terms of their, their effects and their duration. But Ben also made the very important point about this trade-off question, that the supply shocks are, have these trade-off inducing you know, characteristics between inflation and activity, and we would have to judge that again and, and present it as such. Now, I think we would also have to bear in mind, and this is the this is the problem we've had with these with the shocks we've we've been through, that because these shocks might have been transitory and viewed in isolation, 
they came together, and so therefore you had this much longer period of shock. Mm -hmm. The reason I raise that is that although, of course, we're out of that period, there is something of a sort of what I might call a shadow still from it, I think. And so we'd have to, in, in terms of how people re respond to it, so we'd have to judge that as well in terms of how people react. Why if I just pick up one small thing, if I may? Well, I think it's quite a big thing, actually. Um, you're absolutely right that in the short run, I can't think of another period in history when we've seen bigger evidence of this. These, you know, we're a very open economy, huge moves in import prices inevitably have a big, big effect on our rate of inflation. Over the medium term, however, as we like to say, in the absence of those shocks, and you can't see them coming, monetary policy and the credibility of policy are the determinants of inflation. And um, this committee has previously been interested in comparisons with the 1970s. I actually think those are quite instructive for this reason. You know, the, the, the combined hits of the pandemic and the war, at least while they lasted, I'm thinking, say, from the spring of early 21 through to the autumn of 22, were about twice as big as the hit in the 1970s from the rise in energy prices. Absolutely enormous. And yet, two years after that in the 1970s, inflation was still 16%, interest rates were in double digits. This is nothing like that. And the reason, fundamentally, that this is different from the 1970s, to my mind, is precisely that we have a you know, proper nominal anchor, we have an inflation target, and we have a, a body that is charged with setting policy to meet it. Meet it. And uh, so I think that comparison is quite instructive. And you know, it is not the case that policy can't control inflation, even if over short periods of time, and this has been far longer than we would have liked, obviously, global shocks or any other shocks can move you around from it. Ultimately, it's policy and the credibility of pol monetary policy that determines the rate of inflation in the medium term. And that is the striking difference between now and the 70s. Thank you. And we're publishing the nine-page letter that you've sent us, Governor, on things like algorithmic trading uh, today. So, oh, right. Okay. Um, so that'll be out there for um, everyone to, to, to look at. Well, I, I, uh, I won't pretend it's the last word on the subject. No, no, no. <laughs> but it's full of interesting nuggets. Yeah. Um, Angela. Uh, thanks very much. I was interested in what uh, Dr. Broadbent just said, because um, essentially you were arguing that we have a better institutional structure uh, now, um, not only the inflation anchor, but um, I, I felt that you were also at least hinting um, that the independent structure of the Monetary Policy Committee um, helped to strengthen that. And yet there are increasing noises off, particularly from various ex-cabinet ministers complaining and grumbling about the bank's performance. Um, one, who, uh, the member for North East Somerset, who's even pronounced that independence uh, is part of the problem. Uh, to what extent do you think that undermining the institutional structures that have been in place since um, the late 1990s is helpful, Governor, in this in this particular instance? Oh, you'll expect me to be a very strong advocate and defendant defender of uh, the independence of the central bank in this respect, and I am, because Ben, I think, set it out very well. Um, I think one of the lessons we're seeing in this, uh, in this whole period is just the effect of, not as Ben said, the, the nominal anchor, but the fact that the operation of the nominal anchor is in the hands of the independent central bank. Uh, and if you don't mind me saying so, of course, with accountability to Parliament, uh, as, as today, because that's an important part of the whole process. That is the transparency of your decision-making yeah, yeah. process, so, uh, which I mean, we're examining I'm sorry, today. I, in a way, I'm, I'm, I mean, it, it go, almost goes without saying, but I'll say it, yes, I mean, I'm a very firm believer in this. I do understand <laughs> that not everybody uh, accepts that case, and I'm afraid I you know, do not agree with the contrary, the contrary opinion. In that Can sense. I just um, have something to say about groupthink, which has come up as well? I mean... It is a binary choice. You either keep interest rates where they are. Well, I suppose you, you can put them down, keep them where they are, or put them up. So there are only ever three choices that any monetary policy committee can make. Therefore, perhaps not surprising that there is bunching around um, the, the small number of choices that you have. That would be accurate, wouldn't it? Yes, although we have, a, I think, a greater array of um, different uh, you know, 
votes on our committee than some of the central banks have that publish them. And I think, I, I, obviously it's important that we reach a conclusion, but given that, I think it's important and reasonable and sensible that we set out the differences of view, because as I say, you know, nine people can come to reasonably different views on this thing. That, that's, that's why we're here, really. That's why there's nine of us, uh, and, and we operate in, you know, as an independent body, but we each of also, of course, is, is here independently, and we should reflect those views. Thank you. Um, the uh, recent growth figures demonstrated that if one takes per capita growth, um, there's been even mm. less of that, um, and that there's been a, a sort of uh, small declines in in that in the last seven quarters. Does that does that worry you? Because it looks like whatever growth we're getting, and it's terribly modest as we've been talking about, that seems to be based on um, immigration, which the government are currently trying to restrict. Well, go back to what, where I started. Um, it is the case, as you say, that in a situation where we've got a, you know, and I, say, I'm, I think this is a good thing, we've got strong employment in the economy, strong labour market, but we've got weak activity in the economy. Um, per capita GDP is not going to look very good at that point, and you're right, it doesn't. Um, you're also right that, of course, the latest um, numbers that the ONS have published take on board the revisions to the, their, their latest revisions to the population numbers. But I think this comes back to the question that I made, or the point I made earlier about you know, we need to obviously have stable prices. We need to have uh, inflation sustainably at target because the question I think then becomes one of boosting um, the capacity of the supply side through investment and productivity growth. And we've had weak productivity growth for some time now. UK is not unusually. I mean, this is this is a pattern you see in other countries as well. Um, but I think that is the thing that we need to address. Now, to do that, of course, it's better to do that against a background of stable low inflation. To what extent do you think, and I was going to come on to ask why you think that um, productivity has fallen despite full expensing and a range of other um, uh, uh, policies that have been announced to try to address that and to what extent do you think that the political uncertainty around the shenanigans we've had in the last few years has added to the problems with productivity growth or the lack of it? Well I don't think that's the whole story because as I say actually it's a, it's a pattern you see in other, in, in other countries, the UK is not unusual in this respect. I mean we, we have said uh, in, our, first, in the past um, get to read it for me. Yeah, the, the bank has pub I, I said, you know, we'll take no view on Brexit per se, but we have published our economic analysis of it, and we did say we thought there would be a productivity effect in the short run. In the longer run, trade, you know, trade repositions itself, as it were, but that takes a while to, to happen. So there is, there is an effect there, but, but it's, it's not a UK, peculiarly UK thing. I mean, we've seen it go on in other countries. I think there are puzzles. Um, you know, I think there are puzzles as to why you know, some of the technological change we've seen globally has not come through into stronger, stronger productivity. Um, I think there's a big question now about, obviously, the next big question we face is about AI in this respect. What I would caution there, many, many, many years ago, I was, I was an economic historian, is that I think the evidence of past major technological changes is that it does take time for that to feed through into, uh, into, into productivity. Um, there's some, some good work on that subject. And one very thing, just as purely short-term comment, and you're absolutely right, it looks like productivity has fallen over the past year. Some of that, and it's difficult to tell how much, I think is more cyclical than structural. Um, if you talk, if you go on agency visits, there are companies you meet who are doing what we would call as economists labour hoarding. They've seen yes. material declines in activity but not yet laid people off. Um, I went to see a big house builder in the autumn. Had seen a fall of 30%. You know, it's by far the, the, the most cyclical part of the economy and the most sensitive to, to interest rates. But they'd not laid anybody off. And the reason for that is they think, well, things will turn around. It's costly to rehire people, so let's just keep them employed. 
So it's quite possible, we think, you know, the economy is probably now growing in the first quarter, and I think we had it growing again in the second, that, that you get that upturn, but without any increase, the need for any increase in employment. So there's no doubt that, as the Governor said, over the last, basically since the financial crisis, productivity growth has been significantly weaker than it was before. I suspect, even to the extent it's structural, um, you know, the energy price impacts, the import price rises had some effect on productivity itself. You know, the US performance has been much better, but the Eurozone closer to what the UK has experienced. And as I say, some of the weakness over the last year, I suspect, is labour hoarding and to that extent temporary. Um, Are there lessons that could be learned from the experience in the United States in terms of turning productivity around? I mean, they, they too had relatively weak productivity growth. And I mean, the, the real difference has emerged in the last couple of years. And I wouldn't want to say definitively what's caused that difference. But I suspect, you know, the absence of a huge energy price shock was, was one thing. But it's been certainly striking how much better productivity growth has been there than in Europe generally, not just in the UK. Wing, do you have any um, Yeah, so I mean, I would say the, the US has seen um, a, a veritable boom in productivity growth over the past quarter or so. So it's a bit too early to say whether that is, you know, a structural shift or actually just a bit of a blip. It does look a lot better than productivity growth across the rest of the developed world. Um, I know that in comparing investment across advanced economies, the U.S. is the leader pretty much, and the U.K. has been a laggard on that front um, for a number of years since the global financial crisis, and so I think that probably plays into it as well. Thank you. I wanted to um, then just ask about the transmission um, mechanism for uh, interest rate rises, because uh, as we've seen, the bank rate has gone up by 5%, and you estimate that about 2.1% of that has been uh, passed through in terms of savings. Um, to what extent um, do you think that, um, given we're just coming into the, the bank's uh, results uh, season, and we just read this morning that Barclays is doing a share buyback of 10 billion pounds. To what extent do you think that um, the interest rate um, transmission mechanism is working and that savers are being uh, reasonably and properly rewarded? This is something that uh, the committee's been focused on. But with the, the big share buybacks and the sort of weak um, savings rates, is there an issue with the transmission mechanism? Well, I, I, I made a speech, or well, part of a speech on this at Loughborough University last um a week ago, actually. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. No, 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 don't worry. No, no, sorry, no, no reason why you should expect to read my speeches uh, at all. But I was just, just for reference, because I'm going to, re I'm going to refer to it. Um, I mean, I think what we, uh, one of the points I made in that speech is that I think we have seen a re-establishment of the, what I might call the relationship between, uh, particularly say, deposit and saving rates, and and our official bank rates, which had got. In a sense, the relationship had got disturbed by having um, bank rates near to the, at the lower bound, near to zero. And what that means is that banks' net interest margins are now, for the major UK banks, are basically where they were just before the financial crisis. Now, that's relevant, and it's relevant to the point you made about the news this morning, because yeah, banks effectively have to cover the cost of their capital through their earnings. And what I would say now is that I, looking at the major UK banks, I think that is, it, that is in a stable place. So I think the relationship between cost of capital, uh, net interest margins and earnings is stable now. I think they are covering their cost of capital in that sense. I made the point in the speech that I think what happens next should be governed by competition, actually. That's the, that's the thing that should drive sort of whatever happens next. But I think we've had this, this structural adjustment back to the world mm. where our interest rate is, give up, yeah, let's not get, get into the question of whether it goes up or down next, but it's in normal historical territory, if you like. Uh, and so we've seen that sort of relationship in the banking system reestablish itself. So I think that's, a, you know, that's, that's not, not a surprise for me. We've seen some difference between uh, site deposit rates and term yeah. deposit rates, and that's, be, that's regulation because 
we have incentivized banks to take term deposits because they, they don't run as quickly. And I spent quite a bit of time in the Loughborough speech on the mm -hmm. question of run, run risk, given what we saw last year. Um, so that, that is a change that we've seen. But that, 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 that's it. that position, I think, is now, is now you know, stable in that sense. And I think the UK banking system is a sub position. I, I just finished by saying with Barclays, don't want to comment on Barclays themselves, whether they do, I mean, it, there is a choice between buy, doing buybacks and paying dividends, and they, th th there seems to be some greater preference at the moment for, for buybacks from shareholders. So that's, that's why you're seeing some of what you're seeing in, in announcements like the one today. Can I just add from an international perspective, if you look at the pass-through to site deposits in the U.S., the Eurozone, and the U.K., there's actually more pass-through for the U.K. than the other jurisdictions. So for what that's worth, uh, from an international perspective, uh, the U.K. is not massively out of line, in fact, uh, looking a bit better. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to try and sort of sum up, but I also got a quick-fire way of doing that, I think, in terms of questioning. Um, we, we know that we're on Table Mountain, that um, interest rates are at five and a quarter, and the question really, what we've heard today, is how long are we going to be on Table Mountain for? Um, but what I did hear come up very, across very clearly in your evidence is that uh, we're going to come off Table Mountain with a downward move at some point. That's, that's what came across in your evidence very strongly uh, today. However, you are still tightening because you're still doing quantitative tightening and how much tightening is there still to feed through from the previous interest rate hikes? That's a number you should well, know. Can I make two points on that as we've got to come in? First of all, on the previous interest rate hike point, I mean, I think I made the point earlier that our staff have you know, estimated for, for this round um, that they think about 70% of the transmission of previous hikes has come through now. And that's up from 50 back in November for the reason I gave, which is partly the elapse of time, but also because the curve has come down. So the total amount of tightening is less. So therefore... There's still 30% of it to yeah, feed through still, this year. Still on that, and you're on, still on doing quantitative basis. tightening. So you are still well, tightening. Can I, uh, uh, on quantitative tightening, sorry. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we're very clear that it is not an active monetary policy tool. And, and the way in which that works is that we set bank rates having taken into consideration all the information, including where the interest rate curve is, and any effect that quantitative tightening has will come through in the interest rate curve, and so we set bank rate we, we taking that, that into and account. And you've told us that's about 10 to 15 basis points, so, you yeah. know, which is a small but not zero. Okay, so, so you are still tightening. So, uh, well, no, 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 hang on, the, the point yeah. is, is more than that. The point is simply that the current level of bank rate Include takes into account any yeah. dampening yeah. effect of that yeah. 10 to 15 yeah. basis points. So we don't think there's anything overall. If you believe, on, if you believe that quantitative tightening works only via the prices, yes, but mm. we take that into account in the mm. setting of the mm. current bank rate. Mm. So overall monetary conditions, mm. we think, are appropriate, including the effect, any effects of QT. As long as you believe that those effects are transmitted via the prices of financial assets, and as long as you take into account in your forecast those same prices and then base the bank rate on that forecast, you will not be adding any unwarranted tightening through. Yeah. I, I hear what you say, and you are, you are all agreeing, I think, that there is still some further tightening from your previous actions that will feed through into the real economy this year. Although you have also acknowledged in this session that the next move is going to be a downward move in interest rates. Accepting all other point. things being Accepting equal, the point, Mr. Kruger, all other things the, being equal, the, the, unforeseen. The risk in the world, uh, yeah. So I'm going to ask you now to think of uh, where you are as a, being on a seesaw, um, or Table Mountain has been used as an analogy, but you're on a seesaw, and um, you have got uh, two risks on your seesaw. Um, one I'm going to call risk A, which is the risk of over-tightening, and one I'm going to call risk B, which is the risk of labour market and wage pressure leading to sustained and persistent inflation. So out of those two risks, A and B, um, which do you see as being the highest? So this is a quick fire round, so I'm just wanting you to say A or B. Dr Broadbent. Well, Conditional on the fact that we, you know, we, we made a forecast conditional on an interest rate curve which had cuts in it. And it was very clear, if you look at the forecast from with constant interest rates, that it's likely that interest rates will have to be lower at some point. 
So conditional on that expectation, my own belief is that the current bank rate, allowing for the fact that it's likely to fall in future, those risks are balanced, and that's exactly why I voted the way I did. So both I would not A wait one. B no, they're both risks. risks, and at any point in time, you're trying to reach a decision which means that you know, I risk over-tightening just as much as I risk under-tightening, and that's where you want to be. Dr. Dingra, you're very clear that you think that the risks of over-tightening, which are uh, A, are, are more significant. Is that a fair summary yes. of your view? Yeah. And I think the only exception would be a situation where global prices again sort of go spike up. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and Ms. Green? Sure. So I'm in the same position as Ben is in terms of thinking that the risks are balanced, but I'm more worried about the risks of underdoing it because of what I said earlier, the experience in the 1980s having to generally reverse hike rates even more than we would have had to and, and uh, damp demand even further. I think, I think that's a pernicious, the most pernicious scenario. So you're for B being the bigger risk. And Governor, are you for A or B being the well, bigger like, risk? Like Ben, I'm, I'm comfortable with a profile that has cuts in it. Which is not to say I'm going to say when, I, when we're going to cut, or indeed even how much, but I'm comfortable with that profile. I was also comfortable with one other thing, it goes back to Mr. Kruger's point. We had had a risk, an upside risk on inflation, which was to do with persistence. And because of the nature of that persistence, my, my views were being more shaped by the sort of the, the, the profile of the forecast with the risk in it than not. Now we've moved to what I call more of an event risk. I, I, I'm happy to wait and see what happens on that front. If it, if it crystallizes, we'll respond, as we were discussing earlier. So that's, a, that's an important difference where we are. But yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable at the moment with a profile that, that, that has cuts in it, but that is not to say when or how much. And you acknowledge that more tightening is built into your current position on Table Mountain? Well, policy will continue to be restrictive, and you're mm. right to say that there is that, yeah, there is more transmission to come through. But all of that is all of that is factored into our uh, into into our forecast and into our judgment. I'll try to, to conclude with a bit of a quick fire to, to distill the essence of today's session, which has been a long and very interesting session. I think, Dr. Borbent, I'm right in thinking this might be the last time that we see you as you come to the end of your second term. Um, and so can we thank you uh, on behalf of the committee for your, your service over, over the years and your testimony today yeah. and thank everyone else for uh, your testimony and we look forward to seeing you again thank you. soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Portcullis House, the Thatcher Room. 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 Portcullis House, the Thatcher Room.